Okay, here we are in week three. Um, I am in the wrong slide. Let's go way back. Um, I am going to make sure that I stop this recording periodically and check in on the sound quality. I do not know, possibly at all, I don't know what caused the weird kind of double mic sound last time. I have a fancy new mic that I spent a ton of money on. Uh, I have disengaged the built-in mic on my computer. I've tested it again and I cannot make that that sound variation happen again. So I don't know what happened then, but what I will do is so that if we do develop that problem, we don't have um, you know two whole hours of it, I'll stop this lecture periodically and review it, and then I'll stitch them all together um, as we at, at the end of the recording. So this week, oh, one other thing I wanted to say. I know some of you might feel like you're drowning right now um, and that it's, it's hard and tough. I purposely put all of the hard stuff at the beginning of this course. The first four to five weeks are hard and difficult. The last few weeks start to get a whole lot easier. And I do that knowing that um, right now you don't have time. No one, you guys have no time. I am fully aware of that. Uh, but I know it just gets worse as the term goes on. And I would like you to just be taking a deep breath at the end of my course and knowing that I'll, most of the hard stuff is done. Um, so the hardest assignments are happening now. Um, by lecture six and on, things get a whole lot easier. Um, uh, you may have to still be diligent, but they're not going to be as difficult mathematically. So, I love this lecture. I think this one is really fun. There is math involved. This week and next week do have quite a bit of math involved with them. And there's interesting concepts that have to get introduced to you. So, I'll try not to talk, um, uh, too much. I'll try to talk just the right amount and also leave a lot of time for examples for you guys. Um, over the next two weeks, there are a lot of practice problems that you can try out. One of the good things about this lecture is that you can search for a gazillion practice problems on the internet. Um, I have a lot for you in this lecture. You have your assignment, um, and then, which um, you don't have to do a whole problem, but I do break out parts of it. In the solution you'll get, you have a fully worked out example that you'll get with those solutions, even though you don't have to do that all in the assignment. So uh, if that's still not enough for you, feel free to search for more equilibrium problems or statics problems. So that is what today's lecture is all about. Statics, this concept of statics. Um, I have a, a textbook that one half of it is statics and one half of it is mechanics. We are sticking to the statics side. Now, unfortunately, that's an American code and an American textbook, so most of the problem solutions aren't applicable to you. So let's dig into what we're going to do today. Let's start with this concept of why we're even here. We want to figure out that it's strong enough, stiff enough, and stable. And that's what we talked about the past few weeks. One of the things we really, really care about is, is it strong enough? That is the life safety feature. Stiff enough? Eh, that's about some finishes getting destroyed. Stable is very, very, very important as well. But stable we solve pretty easily in a free body diagram. And we're going to talk about what a free body diagram is kind of going forward. When we're talking about whether it's strong enough, we want to know if it's strong enough for axial forces. And those axial forces are compression and tension. We want to know if it's strong enough to resist the internal shear forces. And we want to know if it's strong enough to resist the internal bending forces or bending moment forces and torsional forces. But how do you even figure out what that is? We know we can calculate what the loads are acting on a thing but we need to figure out what it does inside the thing and then what it does to the things that support it. So really, we figure out what the loads are acting on what we're talking about and that's what we did last week. 
This week, we're going to start to talk about what happens to the things that support it. Which I know, it feels like we skipped a part there. What's happening in the middle? Well, what's happening in the middle, or what's happening inside the object, is what we're going to start to talk about over the next two weeks. So right now, we're going to talk about what this whole study or this process is called. And it is called statics. We want to make sure this object we're designing doesn't move up and down in space, slide back and forth, or in and out of the page. We also want to make sure it doesn't spin around. So the branch of mechanics that is concerned with the analysis of loads forces and torques or moment on a physical system in static equilibrium. That is, in a state where the relative position of the subsystems do not vary over time or where the components and the structures are at a constant velocity. Blah. We want to make sure it stays still. Now, we're not talking about deflection. Let me get my handy foam block here. We're not talking about deflection. We're talking about does this thing move up and down? Does it move around in space? But if it is supported nicely here, we're not talking about some internal deformation of the object. We're talking about the object in its overall position in space. We want it to stay still. If it's moving, it's going to squash someone and it's failed. And then we haven't done our job. We want it to stay still. And that is statics. If it stays still, every part of it stays still. If we know that these supports can't move, then right here can't be flying off into space. Or if I said what's happening on this component of it, we know it's not moving in space. So we can figure out what it takes to stay still, even if we pretend to chop it up into bits, which I know sounds crazy. And we're going to do exactly that, but I'm going to walk you through some examples on what I'm talking about. Before we can do that, we need to understand what a force is. Well, a force comes from Newton's second law. It says force is the product of mass and acceleration. Remember, mass is how much water you would displace. Uh, so uh, um, if you sat in a body of water, it would be the same on any object in space. How much water you displaced out of the tub wouldn't change. That's your mass. Acceleration varies on different planets. Yes, I know that seems a bit silly that I'm talking about other planets, but we know what our acceleration is on Earth or how fast we're trying to shoot into the center of the Earth. Force is the product of mass and acceleration. So force has a magnitude and direction and can be represented as a vector. So there's a value to it, or that mass times acceleration is our value, and it has a direction associated with it. We're moving into the center of the Earth as we speak, or uh, maybe something's pushed us that way. So if it has a magnitude and a direction, it's a vector. And vectors, if you remember physics or even math, you touch on vectors, even though you don't even know it, in junior high mathematics. A vector doesn't necessarily have to be a force. It's any value that shows magnitude and direction. For us, we're going to be talking a lot about force. And for us, our force is in kilonewtons or newtons, and a thousand newtons make a kilonewton. So one newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared, or something that has a mass of one kilogram is trying to move into the center of the earth um, uh, at a rate of so many meters per second squared. And that's how we calculate our newtons. And a thousand newtons make up our kilonewtons. All right, let's take a look at this vector I've drawn. Now this vector happens to be a force, which is handy because we're talking a lot about forces. Remember, anything that has a direction and a magnitude is a vector. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the particular vectors that are force. This is um, kind of misleading. Is it only moving in the yz plane and it's kind of at a, a perfect angle there? 
Or is there some 3D dimensionality to this? We can see it's an arrow, but it's really hard to see visually. So sometimes we need a little more information. All right, how can we add up vectors? Now, I know we're rushing through this, but we have a lot to get through today. So vectors, if we have a bunch of things happening, or a, a bunch of forces, say, and we wanted to add them up, how could we add them up? Well, there's a few ways we can do it. And one of the ways that I always say is a great place to start, even if you're going to do math, is to try it graphically. And this is the tip to tail method. So you can graphically connect all the vectors from tip to tail, and the sum of all the vectors is the vector that goes from the first tail to the final tip. What does that look like? Well, if we have this vector, F1, and this vector, F2, and this vector, F3, and this vector, F4, and we wanted to add all of those up, we've drawn them all tip to tail. So this tail starts at this tip, and this tail starts at this tip. The summation of all of these, or the total force, is the first tail to the final tip. We can add all of these up graphically. If you have a really good graphical software, AutoCAD, for example, if you draw things to scale, you could do this quite well. You could add all of these up using uh, vectors. I do it all the time for AutoCAD when I want to add things up quickly. If I want to find um, a triangle, I will use AutoCAD to get those dimensions to figure out the value sometimes. So this is a good graphical way to do it, and I always recommend starting with the graphical method before you jump into the math. Draw yourself a little picture off in the side, because it will tell you if your answer makes any sense at all. We can also break vectors up. So if we can add them up that way, if we had started with this force, we could have broken it down and known that all of these would add up to make this total. Now this seems like a funny way to break it up. It doesn't seem like it would have been that handy for us. If that's what we started with and we wanted to find the resultant, that seems like a really helpful thing to do. But often we like to talk about things in an X and a Y axis. Y being up, X being horizontal. We find that a lot easier, especially if things are in the same plane or along the same axes, the addition is linear. So if we had something this long and something this long and we wanted to add it up tip to tail, well, the total is that added up linearly. So breaking something up into its principal components can be very, very handy. So force vectors can be broken up into components. It's convenient to break up force vectors into components parallel to the principal axes, or x and y components. So for example, if we had this force x, and we wanted to break it up into its x and y components, that would be its x component, and that would be its y component. We know it must be true, because fx plus fy, drawn tip to tail, equals f, so graphically this works, and this is the component along the x-axis, and this is the component along the y-axis. So that looks like it could add us, or lend us, a lot of help by being able to break things into x and y components. So a lot of this you would have definitely done in junior high and probably high school mathematics. So for the most part, it's a refresher, I know it seems like a complicated refresher, um, but you have done all of this math at some point in your life, and we're going to start to do it pretty quickly. So this is just a refresher of what it is. Don't worry, we're not going to do ones that are that complicated. I'm going to show you some complicated ones, and then we're going to see why it was handy to do it. It's so that we can be fast doing it with simple ones. 
And I can tell you that most of the time, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a force, we're going to break it into x and y, we're going to add up all of our x's, we're going to add up all of our y's, and then we're going to turn our x and our y back into a total force. Well, another way we can think about this is we could do it graphically, but for something that has that right angle in it, and we have an x side and a y side with a 90 degree here, well, we know that we can use Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. And we looked at this in our very first week when we talked about math again. So we know that fx squared plus fy squared equals f squared. So if we wanted to know what f was mathematically, not just graphically, f equals the square root of x squared fx squared plus fy squared. So we could draw it, and then we could actually mathematically calculate that. We also know that because we have a really nice right angle triangle here, sine, cosine, tangent works for us. And again, we looked at these in the very first week of our lecture. The sine of this angle equals fy divided by f. The cosine of this angle equals fx divided by f. Because remember, this is the angle, this is our adjacent side, and this is our opposite side. And the tangent of this angle equals fy divided by fx, or opposite divided by adjacent. I, personally, for everything we're going to do going forward, find it very, 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 very handy to draw my angle referenced from our x-axis here. I know we could draw our angle right here, and this would be the opposite side, and this would be the adjacent side, and everywhere we had fx and fy would switch. I am a lazy person. I like to always reference my angle from the x-axis. And I can tell you it's going to make your life a lot easier too, because then here are your equations. Every single time, if your angle is always referenced from the x-axis, these are the equations you can use. You don't have to worry about trying to figure out which one is opposite and which one is adjacent. I've done that for you and written it out right here. What happens when a vector is in 3D? Don't worry, we're not often going to work in 3D. I just want to show you the visuals of 3D because we do live in a 3D environment. Well, here is a graphical representation of my 3D uh, force F. Well, it is in some place in the X, Y, and Z axes. It was hard to know until I drew this little diagram. Or you could say that I had um, a Z component, a Y component, and an X component added up to make this F total force. Again, we could have drawn this tip to tail. So FZ, FX, and FY coming up to this point. We start at our first tail and end up at our last tip, and it would have been the same graphical representation. I wish I had my little uh, touch pen here, but my screen isn't working properly at the moment. I could have actually drawn that in for you. Here's the thing. The same math works when it is a 3D component. So the vector, this little hat just means vector, really what we're saying is fx squared plus fy squared plus fz squared equals f squared, or f equals the square root of fx squared, fy squared, and fz squared. What happens if we want to add up things that aren't orthogonal? We saw that it was really easy to do if we could break it down into basic planes. What happens if we have two forces that aren't on an x plane or a y plane? We know right away we can draw tip to tail, and that's going to help us out. We know that we can start with the, the first tail drawn to the last tip, and that would be the summation of these two. 
So we know graphically, and if we knew the value of these, we could get our head around pretty easily what we might expect that to be. If, if these were two values that we don't have an assigned value to them, but um, if, if this was, if these were pretty close to one, well, this looks like it would be pretty close to two. We don't know exactly, but graphically it looks something along that lines. What is easier to do mathematically is to break our F1 into F1x and F1y, break our F2 into F2x and F2y. We can add up our x's because that's just linear. We know that this distance plus this distance equals this distance. Tip to tail still works, but it's straight addition all of a sudden. So we can sum up our x's and we can sum up our y's or draw in our total x here and our total y here and get our total f. And we can break this down now because we can break f1 into x and y components by using um, the square root of the sum of the squares. If we know some of these dimensions or if we knew an angle, we can figure out what this x and y component is. We can do the same with this. Then we can linearly add up all the x components and linearly add up all the y components. And then f equals the square root of the summed x's squared plus the summed y's squared. We're going to do an example, don't worry. Here it is written out mathematically. f1x plus f2x equals fx. f1y plus f2y equals fy. So f squared, our total force f, is brackets or f1x plus f2x squared plus f1y plus f2y squared. Again, it looks very complicated when we see all of our subscripts and superscripts. We're going to go through an example and work through it together, and you're going to see it's not that hard. The hardest part is the bookkeeping. Basically, keeping your notes clean and organized so that you can see what all of your values are going through it. I will try to do it all, keeping things somewhat color-coded to make life just a tiny bit easier for you. So let's figure out the total vector for this. Now look, we've been talking about forces, but look at this one. They use meters. Well, we're saying if someone walked this distance, and someone walked this distance, and someone walked this distance in those directions, what is the total distance walked? Now, you can start to understand where the tip-to-tail method comes from. And we're going to check this out. Let's take a look. Tip to tail. We've got those same three forces drawn tip to tail. The resultant is the same as starting here and going all the way to here. I always get asked, what if I drew these arrows in a different order? Doesn't matter. Same principle applies. These are the same three vectors. They're distances in this case, in meters, but these are the same three vectors, same resultant, or the same total distance. Same three vectors, drawn in a different order, same resulting vector, or the same summed vector. Let's do it using math now, okay? I'm going to go through and do that same thing doing math. I'm going to pause the video here and check how the mic's holding out. For you guys, this is going to be seamless. Okay, so now let's solve this problem. I have, um, I did notice that there was a bit of echo. I've looked into it. I've done all of the things the, the forums say to do. Um, so hopefully where it comes and goes, I'll try to modulate my voice very clearly. Um, I have one idea of what could have possibly been happening. My sound on my computer was on just a little bit and maybe it was picking up that very low echo through my speaker of my computer. I didn't think I had my mic turned on built into the computer though. So we'll try this out. Okay, first thing I always like to do 
is redraw my problem. So we were given our x-axis and our y-axis like this and we were given let's draw let's draw them in three different colors we were given f1 f1 f2 and F3. Okay. Okay. And we were given that we had different angles for all three of these. We were given this angle. Sorry. We were given this angle as 22.5 degrees. We were given this angle. Look at this. This one's against the y axis. I've already told you I hate having my angle against the y axis because then I have to think. Ugh, who wants to think? This is 22.5 degrees. This vector was. 5 meters. This one was 10 meters. And this one was 7.5 meters. And this angle here, uh, alpha, is 45 degrees. And we want to know what the total force of all of these summed up is. Well, I, for my own pleasure, I'm going to draw them in this order. And I know that my total is going to look something like this. The sum of all the forces. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's going to be something along that line. Something closer to the y-axis than not kind of going off in the positive direction between x and y. So let's go through and see if that is the case. All right. I have said that the easiest way to do it is break all of our forces down into their x and y components. Let's break down F1 into its x and y components. We have F1 is 10 meters. And this would be F1x. And this is F1y. And we want to break these down. We know that this angle right here is 22.5 degrees. And I have said, well, let's just take a look. We have this angle here. We have opposite over adjacent. We know what this angle is right here. We have what this side is right here. So we have angle, opposite, adjacent, um, uh, the total value of it. We know that we can figure out what this one is, or Fy, because it is the opposite side. Or we know that sine of our angle equals F1y divided by F, and the cosine of our angle equals F1x divided by F. We want to know what F1y and F1x are, or F1y equals F times sine of our angle. F1x equals F times the cosine of our angle. Or F1y equals 10 meters times the sine of 22.5 degrees. And F1x equals... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. There's a fly in here. 
I think we bought this. I just got to turn it. Um, F1x equals 10 times the cos of 22 point five degrees. So let's plug that into our calculators. Make sure it's in degrees. We've got 10 times the sine of 22.5 or 3.83 meters. And we've got 10 times the cosine of 22.5 or 9.24 meters. Let's just stop and think about this for a second. We have a much larger x value than a y value. That makes sense from what we see here with this diagram. Let's break up F2 now. F2 is in this direction right here. Here's our so F2 equals 5 meters. We have our F to y and our f to x component. Oh my goodness, it's so high, so driving me bonkers. And we know that this angle right here is 22.5 degrees. Now, I'm going to go through doing it this way. I have told you I always like my angles referenced from the x-axis. I'm going to duplicate that in just a minute. But we right now have opposite is referencing our F2x, or using cosine, and F2y is our adjacent, or cos of our, what angle symbol am I using this one, is F1y divided by F, and the sine of our angle equals F1x divided by F, or F1y equals F times cos of our angle, or, sorry, these are all twos, f2x equals f times the sine of our angle. So f1y equals 5 times the cosine of 22.5 degrees, and f2x equals 5 times the sine 22.5 degrees. We can plug that into our calculator. 5 times the cosine of 22.5 is 4.62 meters. And 5 times the sine of 22.5 is 1.91 meters. I said I'm lazy though. I hate referencing things from the y-axis. Let's just take a look. We'll call this from y-axis. Let's just do that same one again. Because I said I'm lazy, and it's easy for me if sine is always referencing our y, and cosine is always referencing our x. So let's redraw this same one. So we still have that same F2 value equals 5 meters. But let's break it up into F2x and F2y. You can see it's still the same diagram. I haven't drawn it perfectly, but it's still the same diagram. And if we knew that this was 22.5 degrees, we can figure out what this is. Let's call this our prime of our angle. It's 90 minus 22.5 degrees. So let's see, 90 minus 22.5 equals 67.5 degrees. Now we can use the sine for referencing everything to y, and the cosine for everything to x. We're going to take a little shortcut here. I'm not going to write all this out. I'm going to jump right into this. We know that f 
2y equals 5 times the sine of 67.5 degrees, and f2x equals 5 times the cosine of 67.5 degrees. Plug that in. 5 times the sine of 67.5 equals 4.62 meters. And 5 times the cosine of 67.5 was 1.91 meters. So it doesn't matter which way we did it, we get the same answers. And I am lazy, so I am always going to reference everything from my x-axis. We have one more to do here. We have F3. Let's draw F3 now. So F3 we have F3 equals 7.5 meters and we want F3x and F3y and we know that that is 45 degrees. Let's just jump right into it. We can write this out, or we can just, we know that anything that's a reference to the x-axis, as long as we're always referencing our angle from the x-axis, we know that our x component is using the sine rule, and that our y component, sorry, is using the cosine rule, and that our y component is using the sine rule. So we have f3y equals 7.5 times the sine of, sorry, 45 degrees, and F3x equals 7.5 meters times the cosine of 45 degrees. And we can plug these in. We've got 7.5 times the sine of 45 degrees, was 5.3 meters, and 7.5 times the cosine of 45 degrees is 5.3 meters. So we have all of our x and y components now. We have broken every single one of these up into their x and y components. What we want to do is find out what the total is. We know that when we are adding them up, if they're linear, that is okay. We can just linearly add them up. Let's sum up all of our forces in the y-axis. Well, in the y-axis, we had 3.83 meters going upwards and we had 4.62 meters going upwards and we had 5.3 meters going upwards. Let's sum all of these up. We have 3.83 plus 4.62 plus 5.3 equals 13.75 meters. So that's the sum of all the y components. Let's sum up all of the x components. This little symbol means sum. Let's sum up all the x components. Well, we have 9.24 meters, and we have 1.91 meters, and then look at this one. This x component is going in the opposite direction. We, normally in the world, consider up to be positive and everything to the right to be positive in the x-axis. So anything going downwards would be negative, and anything going to the left would be negative. 
So this x component is actually going in the other direction, or minus 5.3 meters. So let's add that up. We have 9.24 plus 1.91 minus 5.3 equals 5.85 meters. So we're saying that we have a component that has an, uh, a force or a, a vector that is uh, this is the sum of my forces in the x direction. And this is the sum of the forces in the y direction. And this is F. Well, we know that that is a right angle triangle. So F is going to equal the square root of the sum of Fx squared plus the sum of Fy squared. Or F equals the square root of 5.85 squared plus 13.75 squared plug this in. Square root of 5.85 squared plus 13.75 squared equals 14.94 meters. Well, we have the magnitude of our vector, but wait a second, we need two things for a vector to be valid. We need magnitude and direction. We want to know what this angle right here is. Well, we have all three sides. We know we can use any one of the rules to figure that out. We have our opposite side and we have our adjacent side. So we know that the tangent of the angle is going to equal the sum of the forces in the y direction divided by the sum of the forces in the x direction. But we want to know what the angle is. So remember, angle equals the inverse of the tangent of sum Fy divided by the sum of Fx, or tangent minus 1 of the sum of the forces in the y direction is 13.75 divided by 5.85. Our angle equals, so we have to use the special function, 13.75 divided by 5.85 gives us 66.95 degrees. So the sum of force 1, force 2, or I guess distance 1, distance 2, and distance 3, uh, its total, which needs a magnitude and a direction, F equals 14.94 meters, 66.95 degrees, from the x-axis. So we took three random vectors and added them up using nothing but trig formulas. So this is all stuff that you should have been able to learn how to do. We're just applying uh, a practical component to it or why you might need to ever do those things. We can see here that I have that worked out for you, again, if you want it. And here is the total answer here, where I just rounded, where I just rounded for the angle. Every year I try to correct that, and every year that summation sign pops back instead of being an angle. So, slide 15, I'll change that to an angle. Okay, let's move on.
Okay, so for you guys, it's only been a brief second. For me, it's been an afternoon and an overnight. Uh, it's currently 4.30 in the morning, um, and that ridiculous echoey sound drove me nuts. So I spent hours manipulating the settings on my computer and my microphone and turning mics on and off. Um, I think I finally have a good balance. So I'm going through and I'm recording the next section of this lecture. All right, so we had all of our forces that we summed up acting on our object, some unknown object. We had three different vectors. Those happened to be meters, but we know that most of what we're going to be doing is in kilonewtons or a force, not a distance. We're probably going to be doing most of these things in kilonewtons as a force. So let's talk about this idea of statics. Statics is sometimes referred to as static equilibrium. If something is static, it's in equilibrium. It's not moving. It's not moving up or down or side to side or in and out of the page. If it's not moving, it's staying still. If we had a force acting on it, pushing it in that direction, which we saw we had a force or a, we summed up vectors and we could see something acting on something going that way. If we want this object to be in equilibrium, we must have something keeping it in place. So equilibrium, each structure is subjected to a series of loads that try and move the structure, such as self-weight, live loads, wind loads, but we want the structure to not move, or we want it to remain in equilibrium. To keep it in equilibrium, there must be an equal and opposite force to keep it in place. This is called our reaction. So if we have a force or a series of forces applied to an object, and we want it not to move, there must be an equal and opposite force keeping it in place. And that is our reaction. Just setting this up so that I can... Right. So let's take a look at that example we just did. Now this one happened to be in meters, but the principle stays the same. We had... Let's just see if we can do this quickly. I'm messing things up too much. We had... We have a an object right here that had a vector like this on it, 14.94 meters, and it was 66.95 degrees from our x-axis. An equal and opposite reaction is R equals 14.94 meters, where that angle is 66.95 degrees. Or we're saying the sum of these vectors needs to equal zero. For it not to move, it must equal zero. We know that we had F plus some known unknown R, and it had to equal zero. Well, we knew what F was, was 14.94 plus some unknown R must equal zero. We can rearrange this and r equals minus 14.94. This all happened to be in meters, but r, our equal and opposite vector, is equal and opposite. But look, we can prove that mathematically as well. Remembering this means sum, so the sum of all of those vectors must be zero. Or we wanted to know what it took 
to find out what the equal and opposite reaction is. Okay, let's make me smaller. All right. So the opposite or negative value of the sum of the forces. So the sum of the forces must equal zero to not move. We want it not to move. So we are trying to figure out what it takes to not move. So F1 plus R equals zero. And so then F1 must equal the negative value of R. Perfect. Graphically, it makes sense. For those of you that get math, this makes sense. If you know one, you can now do the other. All right, we have two forces on this object. We have F1 and F2. We want to know what the reaction is. Well, we know that we could draw this tip to tail and we would have a force coming in right here like this. So an equal and opposite reaction must be right here. Let's go through and look at this. So tip to tail did F1 plus F2. And then we need to sum those forces to find the equal and opposite reaction. So F1 plus F2 equals negative R. Graphically, we can do this very easily. And we're trying to build in this process of doing it quickly mathematically. All right, here's one with three vectors, three forces on it. They all have a value. And you can see what their value is based on scale here. So they're drawn to scale. And they have a direction. We can see that they have an arrow. We haven't given it the exact numerical angle, but we know that there is an angle associated with that relative to the x-axis. Somebody gave us what these values were, or we could even do it with placeholders if we wanted to. The angle of F1, the angle of F2, and the angle of F3. We could go through and figure out what reaction is needed to keep this object from moving. So what if this was a live load, and this was a dead load, and this was a snow load, and we want to figure out what reaction stops this from moving? We can do tip to tail, and there's our force. This is the summation of F1, F2, and F3. And then look at that, the equal and opposite reaction. And we can draw that in now. We can do this mathematically. We've already done it mathematically. And now we know also know how to do it graphically. So here, I just went through this for you. We just did this. All right, here's one for you to practice if you want, for the people that like a little more, um, a little more example problems to solve. I've provided the solution here for you. But you can see we have F1 with F, F1 with 2 kilonewtons and F2 with 5 kilonewtons. F1 is referenced from the x-axis. This is referenced all the way from this x-axis. Maybe it's easier if we do it from this side because this doesn't give us a right angle triangle quite the same way. So we can easily figure out what that angle is. And then we can go through and it's the exact same process. Remember, it looks like the x component of F1 goes this way, and they both go downwards. So here, for those of you that like to work through problems, there's a worked out solution here for you. Consider that a practice problem for those that would like to do it. And here it is all worked out. Remember, always try to start with the graphical method so that you can see if the mathematical number you get matches your expectations. All right, I've been drawing our object as our unknown object as a little funny circle. We'll often refer to that as the centroid. So we might have a bigger object than that, but most of those loads might be acting through the centroid. What happens if they're not? So let's talk about what a centroid is. The centroid is the center of mass or gravity of an or inertia. It's the mean position of matter in a body, the point about which a body will rotate if spinning freely in space. It's the intersection of the neutral axes or median lines. Now, intuitively, centroid is something you do understand. If you try to pick something up so that it doesn't tip over, 
you will try to carry it at its centroid as much as possible or with, with your line of action through the centroid. A, garb, a plastic bag, when you hold it by the handle and it's hanging down straight, that is acting through the centroid. Ooh, oh, coffee, thank you. If you are um, a skater or a skier, it doesn't matter what kind of skating, these principles hold true. If people like to crouch down low to bring their center of mass or their centroid closer to the ground quite often. So intuitively you know that your centroid is somewhere right around here. Most of our mass is in the upper part of our body. Even though our body is very large, the center of our mass isn't in the kind of graphical center of our body. And so we'll often crouch down so that it's harder to tip over. It's funny that tipping over seems to add another intriguing thing here. If we have a force pushing on our centroid, how does dropping our body lower to the ground help prevent us from tipping over? Let's talk about what that could be. So there's our centroid. This is us holding a shopping bag, for example. We've got our line of action directly through the centroid of our shopping <coughs> bag. What happens if we hold it off center from the centroid and there's nothing else happening? We've got our centroid where it would always be, so our shopping bag would tip to try to find that centroid. Anyone who's ever carried a Home Depot bucket with those little metal handles through uh, a bucket, if you have your weight evenly distributed in that bucket, it's no problem. But if you have a rock or something heavy off to one side, your bucket will spin to try to find that line or that neutral axis to pass through the centroid. All right, if we have an object with the force passing directly through the centroid, the body will move or translate in the line with the applied force. So if we apply a force to this directly through that centroid, like this, our object's going to slide. I think we all understood that, and if we wanted to stop it from sliding, we need an equal and opposite reaction holding it in place. If we want something to spin, we would apply a moment, you guys haven't used this term very much, but trying to spin something is the moment, we would apply it to a body and it will rotate about its center of gravity. So we have this object with a centroid and we apply a moment to it. It is going to try to rotate or spin about that point. Now, this one is one that you intuitively understand. If you have your phone or an eraser, you can try this by setting it on your desk even. And maybe I can even do this right here. If I had a force that I applied through the centroid of my phone, it would translate. If I tried to spin it, it would try to spin like that. What happens if I try to apply a force not through the centroid. It looks like two things are happening. Let's bring this back up to me. Two things are happening. It isn't just sliding or just rotating. It is trying to translate and rotate. So we put a force not through the centroid, and this object tries to slide and rotate. Well, we know that sliding is like having the force through the centroid, and the spinning is like having a moment about the centroid. So it seems like this eccentric force, or this force some distance from the centroid, is the same thing as a line through the centroid and a moment. Let's look at that. So that is the same as a concentric force through the centroid and a moment applied to the body simultaneously. 
So a force eccentric looks like it's the exact same thing as a force through the centroid with the moment. It now looks like we have the ability to talk about what moment is. This is something new to us. We haven't been able to talk about this before. So moment causes a body to rotate. So there's that object spinning. If you apply a force eccentric from a body's center of mass, it will cause it to rotate. We also know it causes it to translate. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Just really want to lock this concept of moment into your head. The farther away the force is from the centroid, the more it wants to rotate. It's almost better if you do that with your phone um, this way and try pushing through the centroid like this and then push a little bit from the centroid and then push the same quite a bit from the centroid and it spins a lot easier. So the farther it is away, the more it wants to spin. That is exactly how we quantify moment or calculate the value of the moment or that is how we calculate how much something wants to spin. So the distance E or eccentricity or the moment arm, depending on what the context is, is how far away that force is from the centroid. The force is F. We have a distance away E. Moment is F times E or kilonewton meters. We have a force in kilonewtons and E in meters. And so our moment is going to be kilonewton meters. We can convert these to other units. We can do all of this in other units, but we're going to stick with kilonewtons and meters. So if you've got units in some other format, you're going to want to switch them to kilonewtons and meters for calculating this component of the course. Now, yes, I know we haven't really talked about this force here, but this is a moment about our centroid with a force acting through it is the same thing as this force, some eccentricity from our centroid. That is the value of it. Moment equals P times E. So if we have P, some distance E away, this is the equivalent where we have P acting through the centroid and M, moment, is our P times whatever that distance had been. So these two things are equivalent. These are equal. Let's do a quick example. I'm not going to switch this down and do turn the page because this one's a really quick calculation. We're going to do some more calculations where we work a lot with moments towards the end of this lecture. So we have a force of 25 kilonewtons 0.5 meters away from the centroid. This is the equivalent of some moment and that force acting through the centroid. So we know right away we would have the force through the centroid, but also some moment. And that moment is the force times the distance away from the centroid, or 25 kilonewtons times 0.5 meters. So the moment would be 12.5 kilonewton meters. So moment equals 25 times 0.5, or 12.5 kilonewton meters and a force of 25 kilonewtons, these two systems are equivalent. These two things will have the same effect on this centroid or this body, this unknown object that we're talking about. Well, what if we wanted to duplicate the rotation of that force, but not the translation. So we only want this thing to slot, we only want this thing to rotate, sorry. We want to duplicate the rotation, but not the translation. So we want this thing to spin, but we don't want it to slide. We want something that stops it from sliding. So if you have a force putting, pushing this, this amount in this direction, we need an equivalent force pushing it in that direction. This is something we call equivalent force couples. So let's take a look what 
could cause that. So we only want a moment on our object, but we want to be able to write it as a force and a distance. Well look, this force is going to push the object this way and spin it in that direction. It's going to try to spin it. I got to spin it and it's very hard because I'm looking at a weird reflection of this. So this force is going to try to slide it and spin it in this direction. This force is going to try to slide it in this direction, but still spin it in the same direction. So both of these forces will try to spin the object in the same direction, but they'll stop each other from sliding. So both will cause it to spin, but not translate. It'll cause rotation, but not translation. So we can write a moment as two equal and opposite forces some distance away from the centroid. So let's take a look at this example. We have P1 trying to spin our object in this direction. We have P2 trying to spin our object in this direction. P1 is trying to push it down and P2 is trying to push it up. P1 and P2 are equal. The sum of those is zero. One is downwards and one is upwards. So the sum of the forces is zero. But the sum of the moments, we have P1 times 0.5 and P2 times 0.5. Let's take a look. The moment is 12.5 times 0.5 plus 12.5 times 0.5 or 12.5 kilonewton meters. The sum of our forces is 12.5 down and 12.5 up, so zero. There is no force on that. Okay, moment can also be written as a vector. This is why I did that very first example in meters, because there are lots of things that can be a vector. Um, you can write current as a vector as well, can't you? Yep. Current, current can yep. be a vector. There's all kinds of other vectors. Let's think of a few. There's no the acceleration, yeah. velocity. All of those can be written as vectors. I'm sure there's at least one or two of you that were pros in physics. Maybe you're doing a co-degree in physics. But there are lots and lots of things that can be written as a vector. Anything with magnitude and direction. Okay, moment can also be written as a vector. We're not going to do it that often, but it's important because it allows us to figure out direction of moments. We need some way to talk about these moments and whether they're positive or negative. And understanding that vectors that moments are a vector is the handy way to allow us to talk about that. So let's look at this. Moment can be represented as a vector. We've got our arrow, we've got our little, uh, we've got our, our value, and we can see that it's going in this direction, which means it's got direction. So it's magnitude and direction. We know that the value is force times e. So we have a magnitude of that, and the direction <laughs> is parallel to the axis of rotation. So, what we're saying is, is this vector, this moment, is actually trying to spin about this axis. So, if we are saying this arrow is going in this direction, we're saying it's trying to spin, we're, try, we're saying it's trying to spin, I'm trying to make this match, it's trying to spin about that axis. So, the, these two things are the exact same. Sometimes for a moment vector, to not confuse it with our force vector, we'll put two arrowheads on it, just because it makes it easier to talk about. But most of the time, we're not even going to be writing it. We're going to do this to help figure out what is positive and what is negative of a moment. Moment vectors are added in the same way as any other vectors. So this is where that information is very, very, very handy. We know that for the most part, we're going to be working with x 
and y and possibly z axes. That one was off in some weird axes direction. We're going to work in our principal axes. The direction of a moment vector can be determined from your right hand. Hold up your right hand. Don't use your left hand. It's all about your right hand. If you hold your thumb with your fingers curled, that is telling us the direction of our moment. So if I am doing this, I am curling my fingers about my thumb. My thumb tells me the direction of my vector. To you guys, this looks like it's positive or in the x-axis positive. This is in the y-axis positive. And this, coming out of the page, is in the z-axis positive. This would be negative, this would be negative y, and this would be negative z. So, your thumb tells you positive and negative, or the direction of the vector, and your fingers are the direction that the moment is curling. Now, all of this is super handy because that's going to help us know if a moment is positive and negative. And that's going to be really important because remember, we don't want our object to move, but we also don't want it to spin. And so we're going to have to try to sum up all our moments to make sure our object doesn't spin. And if we have multiple moments on it, we're going to need to know if it's positive or negative. So we live in a world with six degrees of freedom. Objects can move up, objects can move, so up and down is one, along the x-axis or side to side is two, in and out of the page is three. But we also have three other ways an object can move. It can spin about y, it can spin about x, or it can spin about z. So that's three other ways our objects can move. That's six total six degrees of freedom. Translation compared to x, y, z, and rotation about all three of those axes. We find life a lot easier working in 2D space. It makes our life easier. Most problems pair down to 2D, and if you need to, you can do one 2D analysis, and then you can do another 2D analysis, and then you can do the third 2D analysis. But I'm going to tell you that for the most part, just working in a very simple 2D world is going to solve the 99% of our problems. So, if we wanted to work in an X and Y plane, which is what matches our sheet of paper very handily, we can think about the only ways that the object can move in 2D space, acknowledging that in 3D space there are six degrees of freedom. So if we're only working in the xy plane, we have restraint for translation about the, about the, uh, we, have tra we have restraint for in and out of the page because we're working in a 2D plane. We can't come off of that plane. We can't spin about the y-axis, otherwise we're spinning our piece of paper. And we can't spin about the x-axis because again, we'd have to spin our piece of paper. So all we're left with is up and down motion, side to side motion, and rotation about Z. The, all of the things I could do with my phone. Up and down, side to side, and rotation about Z. So this is what we're doing in our 2D space. This is how we're worrying about movement. Now, a handy way to draw all these forces, because you can have very beautiful, beautiful diagrams. A handy way to represent these forces, and this is where the architect in you is going to cringe a little bit, and mathematicians and engineers revel. We get rid of all of the other stuff. We break things down to, quite often, either a centroid or an outline shape of the object. We draw all of our forces and moments as arrows and we draw all of our reactions as the restraint arrows that hold it in place. That's it, we get rid of everything else and we show where those apply to our object. 
So we have for a free body diagram, we have to show all the forces acting on the body. If it's through the center of mass, we want to show that. All the moments acting on the body. All the restraints that keep our body in equilibrium and all the dimensions from a reference point to those forces, moments, and reactions. So look at this. We have a car. We know that this car is actually existing in a 2D plane, or in a 3D plane. We know there's depth to that. We know that this tire that is sitting on the ground, that is stopping the car from going into the center of the earth, because there's a weight associated with the car, that the tire is pushing back up or the ground is pushing up on the tire, so there must be a reaction there. But we also know that there's really two tires here. There's a third plane to this. But it is very easy to break this diagram down to a 2D plane and think about it. We have the weight of the car. Now this car isn't moving. This is a parked car. It is sitting there and not moving. If it was moving, you're not in my class. Get rid of it. Think, don't think about it. Go over and find the mechanical engineering program. Go talk to Alex and B Bodmani. Go talk to other people. We are talking about statics here. So, if we have our weight passing through the centroid, we have something that is stopping this car from sinking down into the center of the universe. So it's the reactions of our tires here. We have our front tires pushing up and our rear tires pushing up and we can see where all of these are acting relative to some reference point. We could have picked the reference point of the centroid if we wanted and dimensioned these tires from the centroid or the weight of the center of the car. It's up to you, but they all have to be referenced from something. You have to be able to figure out how those dimensions or where those forces are located relative to each other. Let's take a look at this. This weight passes directly through the centroid of the car. So it's not trying to make the car spin. Look at this reaction. This is the centroid of the car. This spot where the car interacts with the ground is actually trying to make the car spin that way. And this spot where the reaction is pushing up on the car is trying to make the car spin that way. So we've actually got things trying to make our car spin? That sounds absolutely crazy. Well. We know our car isn't spinning, so what's stopping it from spinning? Well, this moment must be equal and opposite to that moment. There must be things stopping this from spinning because we have things applied to it that are trying to cause it to spin, or the reactions are trying to make it spin. I know, it sounds like crazy. Everything is trying to make things spin, but it, if it isn't, there must be something stopping it. If the same car was parked on a hill, but it is not moving, we have the same weight pushing it down into the center of the universe. We have reactions that stop it from sinking down into the center of the universe. But we also have something that stops it from trying to roll down the hill, or friction. We have more reactions introduced into this. Now this is a complicated one. This is probably beyond what we're going to solve but I just wanted to show you what these free body diagrams look like. In my graduate course, the elective that I'm teaching, Dave last week spent an hour going through solving reams and reams and reams of free body diagrams, way beyond the scale of this course. But if you um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, oh my God, it feels dirty saying that. I in no way get anything from that. But literally, if you subscribe to, uh, to my lectures or my videos, the ARC uh, 3405 lecture series for, um, uh, I believe it was the first week one, um, where we looked at, it was strength, stiffness, and stability, Dave drew probably 30 free body diagrams. Just that gets your head around things. I'll even put a link into it in the lecture, just for anyone who wants to see it. Most of those free body diagrams are way beyond what we'd be doing in this course. But I know there are some of you that really like to go above and beyond, but I am no way making you watch that video. All right, if we're going to start drawing these free body diagrams, we need a way to talk about them. All right, we have um, our x, y, and z coordinates. 
we have a force drawn with an arrowhead. A moment would be drawn with a double arrowhead, but often we'll draw it as a curved thing. But we know if we follow that curve with our fingers, our thumb tells us what direction that arrow would be pointing if we were talking about it as an arrow. If we have a little bit of load everywhere along the length of something, we call it a uniformly distributed load or a stress profile. And these are the ways we would draw it. We're going to get into that, but I just wanted to talk about it right here for now. So that's gonna go into next week just a little bit when we talk about some of these internal forces. Um, we have our free body diagrams as our reactions. So if I will often try to draw them red for you guys, but in a normal state of the world, they'd all just be drawn in the same color pen. Uh, if we have a pin support, we have uh, a reaction up, and a reaction back and forth. So we have a reaction up and down, and we have a reaction back and forth. There is something holding that in place. This is a pin support, and this is a pin support. It is not a moment support, meaning that if I let go of one of them, it would try to spin about that point. A roller would be like setting these on my pens. If we put a force that way, it could still slide but we have something stopping it from going down. So a roller support only restrains it in one direction, either up and down or back and forth. A moment connection is a fixed connection. It stops all things. If I held this so that it couldn't spin, that would be a moment connection. So this means I now need to be able to resist up and down force, back and forth force, and the ability to rotate. If we are drawing things at a joint, often we will just leave a gap in things, and that just means it's pinned. We are not trying to moment connect those things together. We Sometimes in, in our software, it'll be drawn as a dot here. A moment connection will often draw as a big, dark, built-in circle. If you guys remember from those drawings that I made for you uh, in the second week, we actually had uh, moment connections drawn in some of those diagrams. So you could see that there. And I said it was important to indicate that it was MC, or a moment connection. So for something to be statically determinate, or an ability to calculate that this thing is not moving, we need at least one restraint for each degree of freedom. We need something to stop it from going up and down, move back and forth, or spin about in space. Remember though, a moment can be written as equal and opposite forces. So we don't necessarily need to see a moment on there. Remember that car, we knew it was trying to spin, but we also knew it wasn't spinning, so there must have been something stopping it from spinning. But we knew that those forces could be written as moments if we wanted to. So it seems like as much as we can have a moment on something or a moment reaction, it might not be as apparent that we do in fact have it. It could be multiple forces acting as our moment resistance. A free body diagram of a beam. So here's a pin, here's a roller, here's a uniformly distributed load acting on our beam. This, I'm going to tell you a secret, is 99% of what we are going to talk about this term. This little diagram right here is probably the most important diagram we're going to talk about in structures. Well, we know that this is an applied load of some sort. We know that the pin stops it from moving up and down and moving back and forth. And we know that this circle stops it from moving up and down. So it looks like we have something that stops this object from moving up and down and moving back and forth in space. But what's stopping it from spinning about in space? Well, we have two forces that are some distance apart. 
if there was something trying to make this spin, maybe these two forces being some distance away from the centroid of this object are the thing that stops it from spinning. So here we have, I'm just going to draw a few other beam configurations. We have a pin and a roller. So we've just done this one. Here's a cantilever. Look, this is a fixed support we've drawn here. So we know that must be a reaction up and down, back and forth, and a reaction that stops it from spinning. So the free body diagram of that element looks like this for the reactions. This one's really weird. We've got something that stops it from going up and down, but not sliding back and forth. We don't have something that stops it going this way, but we do have something that stops it going back and forth. But where's the moment connection? Look at this. See, we've got that triangle drawn here. So this has a reaction that stops it from spinning, but not moving up and down. Very, very, very weird connection. I can tell you that I have done two of these in my life. They are wild. One of them took me about a week to calculate, not just to calculate, but to detail, because building this is really hard. So that's the question. How do we actually build these things? What do these things look like in the real world? Well, most of the time, a pin roller connection is just how things are built. That is just the natural way things are built. And so the question is, how do we actually make it slide at one end? Well, if the object is big enough, a bridge, for example, they actually put Teflon pads under the end of that object. If we want to allow something to rotate, the way we connect our details here allow just the tiniest little bit of movement. Now, I don't want you to get too worked up about this. This is just the natural accepted way we accept that things are detailed. But the way we detail steel connecting to steel has just the tiniest little bit of rotation allowed in it, which means there is no moment connection. A moment connection would have a big steel plate here and a big clip here and probably still this acting on it here. So a lot more work at the connection to make it a moment connection. And we don't like moment connections because they're harder to build. If you have a big object, so this big object here would have, if we tried to just pin it in the way we would normally de detail something, would end up actually still being a moment connection. And we didn't want a moment connection here, we wanted a pin. So this was detailed to very much be a pin connection. Again, that is beyond what we need to talk about. Now, let's talk about that equilib equilibrium issue again. We talked about how it's not moving, it's up and down, back and forth, in and out of the page, and in a 2D world, up and down and back and forth. But it's also not rotating. So we said it's not spinning about Z, it's not spinning about Y, and it's not spinning about X. If we're talking about a 2D world, we're worried about it spinning about Z. So a body in equilibrium may not rotate or translate in all degrees of freedom. To remain in equilibrium, there must be equal and opposite forces or a moment to keep it in place. Those are the reactions. So this is just the same statement we had before. Another way to say this is the sum of all the forces and the reactions in each direction must equal zero. If there is anything left over and the sum of all of those things isn't zero, we're going to have moment or we're going to have translation or rotation. If we're talking about a system with three degrees of possible movement, so our 2D world, we need to prove not moving in these three directions is what is, we need to figure out what is required to ensure it doesn't move. Or that the sum of the forces in X, that the sum, sorry, the sum of the forces in X, the sum of the forces in Y, and the sum of the moments about Z equals zero. That means it's not moving. So sum of the forces in Y, the sum of the forces in X, and the sum of the forces about Z. Now look at this. I've drawn some little arrows that tell me what direction is positive. 
We already know that most people, and since most people do it, you guys are going to do it too, up is positive, down is negative. But I, I put a little reminder here. This arrow is saying, don't forget world, up is positive. I've put a little arrow here saying that, am I drawing, that X is positive. It's backwards for me. I'm looking from behind my finger here. That that way is positive, or to the right of your page is positive, and to the left of your page is negative. And then spinning about Z, ah, this is the good one. If your thumb is coming out of the page, your fingers curling is the positive direction. So out of the page is positive for Z, we know that. And we know our thumb can represent that vector. So if we put our thumb in the positive direction, coming out of the page for Z, that is the direction of our positive moment curling. Or spinning this way about Z. If you put your thumb coming out of the page, that direction is positive. Okay, let's jump in to some examples. I love this example. I'm going to go slower than I normally would. If you prefer, you can go ahead and do these calculations on your own and not watch the videos and get through this faster. So I might go over a little bit, but I know the people that understand these things can scrub through the video and jump right to the answers. So I might go longer than I normally would, but this is to benefit the people that struggle. All right, we're gonna talk about our, um, we're gonna talk about free body diagrams and reactions and applied forces and applied moments and equilibrium. So that means making sure something doesn't sink down into the center of the earth, slide off along the ground, or spin off into space, or spin around an axis. I find a really easy way to start talking about this is with a teeter-totter. So here we have a teeter-totter where we have two Shannons sitting on the teeter-totter. Now, I'm assuming most of you have used a teeter-totter at some point in your life, and look at this. Look how I've drawn this pin connection here. We know that the teeter-totter is not sinking down into the center of the earth, and we know that the teeter-totter is not moving sideways in space. You would intuitively draw that as a triangle. We also know that it is allowed to spin about our Z axes. So we do have that rotation happening about our Z axes. So if you've ever played with a teeter-totter or a scale, my five-year-old is doing that in school right now. In fact, my three-year-old is doing this in daycare where they are balancing things on a scale. And this is where I say intuitively you understand many of these topics. And that's why I like doing the teeter-totter example because you intuitively understand so much about it. Now, if I have two Shannons, who have eaten the same thing for breakfast, they're exactly the same weight, sitting the exact same distance from the center of the teeter-totter, what do you intuitively think is going to happen? This is where I like you to do this mental exercise. You know that this stops us from going up and down, this stops us from going back and forth. This Shannon is trying to spin it this way. This Shannon is trying to spin it that way. And you know that they're both trying to spin it about the same amount because they're the same distance away and the same weight. So that the sum of those moments should be zero because you know that this is a balanced scale or a balanced teeter-totter. So everything I'm about to do mathematically, you already intuitively understand. And this is putting numbers to it. Let's do it by drawing it as free body diagrams and solving or figuring out what the sum of the forces in the x direction are, the sum of the forces in the y direction are, and the sum of the moments about the z axes. All right, what we have right here is, uh, let's make my writing bigger for you. Here we are. All right, what we have is a teeter-totter, like this. We know that a pin has a reaction like this 
and a reaction like this, or Ry and Rx. And we know that we have Shannon 1 and Shannon 2 sitting here like this. And we have some distance, so that's E1 and E2. We don't know what these values are yet. I will give those to you. We could weigh me and figure out what that is in kilonewtons, and then we can actually measure how far away I am sitting from the centroid, or the center of the teeter-totter, and we can quantify those values. But before I do that, I just want to redraw this in another way. We know that this is the same thing as Ry Rx, we know that this is a moment trying to spin in this direction, or it's the same thing as S1 pushing down and M1 trying to spin it, and S2. and M2. We know that these two things are equal. Well, look at this. We know that we have two forces pushing down and something pushing up. We have a moment spinning this way and a moment spinning this way. We can calculate what those moments are. Let's figure out what that is. Let it, let's first assign some values to these. So Shannon gets on a scale and weighs herself. Shannon equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons. Shannon is sitting... How far away am I sitting? Shannon is sitting 0 0.8 meters away from the teeter-totter center. So that means S1 equals 0.65, S2 equals 0.65, and we said that E1 equals A2. We're setting that. Shannon is sitting there. That's where Shannon is choosing to sit. Shannon is choosing to sit 0.8 meters away from the center on both situations. So we now know that S1 equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons. S2 equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons. E1 equals 0 0.8 meters. E2 equals 0 0.8 meters, and we know that M1 equals S1 times E1, or 0 0.65 times 0 0.8 equals, I didn't leave enough room there, 0 0.65 times 0 0.8 equals 0 0.52 kilonewton meters. M2 equals S2 times E2, or 0 0.65 times 0 0.8, 0 0.52 kilonewton meters. This still haven't, hasn't proven to us that this isn't moving in space. Let's take a look at this. Let's sum all of our forces in the y axis. Remember, up is positive. Here's a little reminder to ourselves that up is positive. This little symbol means sum of, and Fy is telling us that we're talking about all the forces in the y direction, and we want this to be zero. We are hoping this is zero. If this is zero, then this is in equilibrium and we're trying to figure out if it is in equilibrium. So let's see if this is in equilibrium. We have S1 going downwards. Remember, upwards is positive. So S1 is downwards. 
we have S2 going downwards, and then we have this unknown reaction, Ry, going upwards. We're assuming it's going upwards. We have no idea. I've drawn it going upwards. Let's see. We want this to be equal to 0. Or we're saying that minus 0 0.65 minus 0 0.65 plus Ry equals 0. If we rearrange this, we add these up, we bring them over to the other side, which changes their sign. Ry equals 1.3 kilonewtons. So for this system not to sink down into the center of the Earth, the Earth must be pushing back with 1.3 kilonewtons of force. So that's stopping it from going up and down. Let's look at the sum of the forces in the x direction. That way is positive. We have no applied loads. And we have our x. Oh, our x equals 0. Perfect. There's no loads acting on it, so there's nothing to resist. And it's not moving. So therefore, yeah, our x is 0. Let's sum the moments where everything in this direction is positive. So if we curl our fingers in the direction that arrow is going, my thumb is coming out of the page, which is positive. Remember, out of the page is Z positive. So we're curling in this direction, and we want to spin about the Z axis. So that's telling me we're doing it about the Z axis. And we are going to spin it about this point right here. We're going to spin it about the pin. And we want it to be zero. We don't want it to spin in the world. We want it to stay still. Well, let's look at this. We had, um, if this is our pin right here, this isn't trying to make it spin, and that's not trying to make it spin. We've got M1 trying to make it spin, and M2 trying to make it spin. Let's look at it. Let's not look at it this way. Let's look at it this way for a second. Well, we have S1 trying to make it spin, and we know that moment is force times eccentricity. So S1 is trying to make it spin this way, and S2 is trying to make it spin this way. Let's take a look at this. If this is our pin, we're saying that that point right there is our pin, which, funny enough, it's actually our pin. And we put our thumb right along that point, and we curl our fingers in the direction this is trying to make it spin, we can see that that moment is positive. So this force is causing a positive moment on our teeter-totter. We know that moment is force times distance, or plus S1, E1. That's just this, for this moment right here. You could say that this is M1. This is just to remind us what we've done here. Look at this. S2 is trying to make it spin in this direction. Or, if this is our pin, and we curl our right hand, remember, always use your right hand, we curl our fingers in that direction, we can see that we have a moment causing it to spin in that direction, which is our negative direction. My thumb is pointing into the page, so therefore it must be negative. S2 times E2, which is really just the same thing as M2. We've already calculated that. And there's nothing else causing it to spin here. We want this to be zero. Well, we've already calculated that S1 times E1, or 0.65, times 0 0.8 minus 0 0.65 times 0 0.8 0 or 0 0.52 minus 0 0.52 equals 0 0 does in fact equal 0. We had nothing to resist the moment so we needed for this to be in static equilibrium we needed the applied moments to equal 0 which they do perfect for us. That's exactly the situation we wanted. 
what happens, so that's all worked out for you here, what happens if Shannon 2 gets off the teeter-totter and Dave gets on the teeter-totter in the exact same spot? And we can all assume that Dave weighs a lot more than me. And so now we have Shannon 0.8 meters away from the center of the teeter-totter and Dave 0.8 meters away from the center of the teeter-totter. Let's see what implication that has on our teeter-totter situation. Okay, so it's the same thing. So I'm going to start to do this a little bit faster each time. So we're being told that Shannon still weighs 0 0.65 kilonewtons and she's still sitting 0 0.8 meters away. So let's draw our teeter-totter. And we have a reaction here and a reaction here. And we have Shannon sitting here, and then we have Dave sitting right here. And we know that Shannon is 0.65, and that is E of Shannon. Dave, we're being told, weighs 0 0.85 kilonewtons. Remember, we can figure out kilonewtons by knowing what the kilograms are and multiplying it by acceleration, which for Earth, going down into the center of the Earth, is 9.814 uh, meters per second squared. We can figure out what the kilonewtons are. Dave just sat exactly where Shannon 2 had been sitting. So the eccentricity of Dave equals 0 0.8 meters. Intuitively, do you think this is in equilibrium? If you put two things, one heavier than the other, on a scale the same distance apart, so in those trays which are set distance apart, you put a light thing on one side and a heavy thing on the other, does this scale move? Does this teeter-totter move? Intuitively, Yes, you know it does. You know that this is not in static equilibrium. Let's go through and prove it to ourselves. I'm going to start to do this faster, and we're going to cut out some of the steps. Let's sum the forces in the x direction, where everything in that direction is positive. We have no applied loads. We have our x. Oh, our x equals 0. Perfect. Let's sum the forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive, and we want to know what it takes for this to be in equilibrium. Well, Shannon is pushing downwards, so we've got minus s. Dave is pushing downwards, so we've got minus d for Dave, and we've got r1 pushing upwards, or sorry, ry pushing upwards. I guessed at Ry. If my answer is positive, I'll know I drew Ry correctly. If I get a negative number, it's saying that Ry is actually downwards. Intuitively, what do you think? Is the reaction going to push in that direction? Yeah, it is. Let's put some numbers in here. Minus 0.65, minus 0.8, plus Ry equals 0. We can rearrange this and Ry equals 1.5 kilonewtons. That teeter-totter has to push up with 1.5 kilonewtons. So whatever we build here has to be strong enough to resist 1.5 kilonewtons. This pin here has to be able to support 1.5 kilonewtons then the bearing of it on the soil needs to support 1.5 kilonewtons, and the soil needs to be strong enough to resist 1.5 kilonewtons. So we're starting to see how these steps move forward a little bit. 
let's now sum our moments about the z-axis. So spinning everything about that z-axis, we know that we're going to call everything spinning in that direction as positive, and we want to know if this thing is in equilibrium. Well, let's see. We've got our force S, and this is the point we're going to spin it about. So let's spin it about our pin. We're going to spin it about this point right here. So we're sorry, we're, we're, we're going to put our thumb right there, and this is trying to push it in this direction. If I literally put a pin right here and pushed where Shannon is, my page tries to spin in this direction. If I curl my fingers in that direction, so the same direction it's trying to make it spin, and point my thumb, my thumb is pointing out of the page. That is positive. So plus, and a moment needs a force and an eccentricity. Shannon times the eccentricity of Shannon. And then Dave is trying to make this spin in this direction. So I can roll my fingers in the direction Dave's trying to make it spin, and then I can figure out if that's positive or negative. My thumb is pointing into the page. That means it's negative. So minus D times ED. There's nothing else trying to make this spin about the point of the pin. Our Y passes through it and our X passes through it. Remember, a force passing through the centroid only tries to cause translation. It does not try to make it spin. So this, we want to know if it equals zero. Well, Shannon was 0.65 times E of Shannon was 0.8 minus 0.85 times 0.8 equals 0. We get that, uh, let's plug that into our calculator here, we've got point, 0.65 times 0.8 minus 0.85 times 0.8 we get minus 0 0.16 equals 0. That's not true. This is not in equilibrium. So this isn't true. This isn't static. And as you know, this teeter-totter would try to tip down on Dave's side, or it would try to spin in that direction. We got a negative moment, so it's trying to spin in that direction. And it would not be in equilibrium until Dave's bum sat on the ground. And then we would have a different free body diagram. What would it take for Dave? How could, who did I move here? Who do I move? All right. What distance would Dave need to sit away from this point to make sure we were in equilibrium? We now want to know what ED, or what distance away, Dave needs to sit to make sure the teeter-totter's in equilibrium. Intuitively, what do you think? I think Dave would need to scooch forward just a little bit. No, that doesn't sound right. Wait. Yeah, Dave might need to scooch forward a little bit. So Dave wants to cause less moment. Move it further away. More moment. Move it closer in less moment. So we're going to need Dave to move forward a little bit. We think. That's our estimate. We can calculate this and figure out what it takes. So let's do this same problem where we have our y and our x and we have Shannon sitting here and Dave sitting some distance away that we don't know what it is. And this is E of Shannon and this is the E of Dave. We know that Shannon is 0.65 kilonewtons we know the E of Shannon 
is 0 0.8 meters. We know that Dave hasn't changed his weight. He's still 0.85 kilonewtons. But we want to know what the E of Dave is to make this be an equilibrium. Okay, let's go through those same equations that we have to see if something is in equilibrium. Sum the forces in the x direction, where everything in that direction is positive. We have our x equals zero. Perfect, it's in equilibrium. Let's sum our forces in the y direction. So this is up and down, where everything in the up direction is positive and we want to see if it's in equilibrium. Well, we have Shannon acting downwards. We have Dave acting downwards. But we also have our unknown RY acting upwards because we have a reaction there. We have something that can resist these loads. We have minus 0.65 minus 0.85 plus RY equals 0. We can rearrange this and RY equals 1.5 kilonewtons. We have to make sure when we build this thing that we have something that can support 1.5 kilonewtons to stop it from sinking down into the center of the earth. Now let's sum our moments about the z, the z axis. We'll spin it about the pin and we want to know what it takes or we want to know if this is in equilibrium. Shannon this is the pin right here. Shannon is trying to make it spin in that direction, which is the positive direction. So positive Shannon times the E of Shannon. And then Dave is trying to make it spin in the negative direction. So minus Dave times E Dave equals zero. Well, we know what Shannon weighs. It's 0.65. We know what the E of Shannon is. It's 0 0.8 minus the D, or minus D is 0.85 times ED. We don't know what ED is. We want to figure out what it takes to make this be an equilibrium. We want to find out how far away Dave needs to sit from this teeter-totter. Well, we have 0.65 times 0.8, which we bring over here and becomes negative and then we divide it by negative 0.85. Or we have 0.65 times 0.8 divided by 0.85. Dave needs to sit 0.61176 meters away from the center of the teeter-totter. So this distance here needs to be less than Shannon's distance away from the center of the teeter-totter. Again, intuitively, we knew that. That is something we understood. Okay, here is where I'm going to blow your mind. If this is in static equilibrium, it's in static equilibrium. We picked the pin to spin these points about because that made sense. That worked well for us. But what if, what if we didn't pick that point right there? What if we said, well, let's pretend we're spinning this about Shannon's bum. Weird thing to do. I get it. But what if we did pick that point? What if we imagined this was trying to spin about this point? Well, we know Dave is pushing down here, but now there's a reaction that's trying to make it stop spinning. Because it's not, we know, intuitively, that the teeter-totter is not spinning about Shannon's bum. And Shannon, if all of this is true, isn't moving up or down or back and forth or spinning. So that means these same equations should still apply. Let's see if that is in fact the case. So we are going to do this exact same problem but we're going to imagine that it's not spinning about the pin. We're ridiculously going to imagine that it's spinning about Shannon's bum instead. So let's just take a look at what that looks like. So this is our pin. 
we do have an actual pin here. We have our Y and our X. And we have S and we have D. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, yeah, let's do it by solving it this way. We're going to do ES and DS. We've already calculated what DS needs to be here, but we're going to spin it about this point here. So we know that Shannon equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons. E of Shannon equals 0 0.8 meters. We know Dave equals 0 0.8 five kilonewtons and we know the E of Dave equals 0 0.61176. I'm keeping a few significant digits just because um, I normally wouldn't um, but there's a rounding number in this that one year a student really got caught up on so I'm going to keep this as much as possible just to show how this all works out. Um, are they both asleep? Are they both asleep? This is the problem with recording a lecture starting at 4.30 in the morning, is that it's a dangerous grounds for your kids waking up in the middle of recording your lecture. Okay, now, this is where I blow your mind, and we're recording this, imagining we're spinning about this point right here. We're spinning it right around Shannon's bum. So, let's sum our forces in the x direction, where everything in this direction is positive. We have um, uh, Rx equals zero. That makes sense. We want to sum our forces in the y direction where everything upwards is positive. We have uh, minus 0 0.65 for Shannon, minus 0 0.85 for Dave, plus our unknown Ry. We want it to equal zero we calculate that Ry equals 1.5 kilonewtons. That hasn't changed. The total weight on this system stays the same. Now, let's sum the moments about the z-axis where everything in this direction is positive. But now, instead of spinning it about the pin, we're going to spin it about S. We're going to spin it about Shannon's bum right here. And we want to know if this is in equilibrium. Well, look at this. Shannon passes right through Shannon. Remember, to be a moment, you need a force times an eccentricity. The eccentricity of Shannon from this point right here <coughs> is zero. So that doesn't cause a moment. We have uh, our Y. He is now trying to spin our paper in that direction. We can curl our fingers in that direction. And that tells us that our Y is trying to spin this in this direction. Or plus our y times es is our moment of our y trying to make the system spin. Our x also passes through the node, so it's not trying to make it spin. D is trying to make it spin, and again, it's trying to make it spin in the negative direction. So minus D times its distance away from Shannon. So it's not the distance from our Y now. It's this whole distance, or ES plus ED. Let's, let's just do this and see if we get the same ED here. We know what ES is. Let's pretend we don't know what ED is. Let's see if we get this same value had we done it spinning it about Shannon's bum. Well, we have already calculated our y is 1.5. We know that the e of Shannon is 0.8. Minus, oh, and we want this to equal 0. Dave, we know, weighs 0.85 kilonewtons. We know es is 0 0.8 plus our unknown ed equals 0. We can rearrange all of this and figure out what ED is. I'm going to break it up in steps here. 
So we have, well, let's just rewrite it. E d is going to equal minus 1.5 times 0 0.8 divided by minus 0 0.85 minus 0 0.8. That's just me rearranging that equation. Or 1.5 times 0.8, sorry, 1.5 times 0.8 divided by 0.85 minus 0.8 equals 0 0.611176 meters. So look at that. It doesn't matter if I picked this point to spin about or this point to spin about. I get that Dave needs to sit the same distance away from this teeter-totter pinpoint to make sure the system works. Okay, I have, let me bring this up to me. So I have for you, should you choose to do them, more examples in here. So here are the ones we just did, all worked out for you as well. So remember, if it's in equilibrium, it's not moving or rotating, no matter where you sum everything up. You can pick whatever you point, point you want to use as the point you're summing things. So, we did all of that. I have an example here, and an example here, and an example here, that I am going to record a separate video for the people that would like to see these worked out. I have the solutions worked out here for you. So these are fully worked out. They're quick, easy ones. I know they look complicated, but they're not that hard. I'm gonna record that as a separate video for the people that would like the assistance. So, you have three bonus examples here that you can do to practice on your own and then watch the video or just look at the calculations if you would like. So then today's takeaway tips. Everything needs to be strong enough, stiff enough, and stable. It's statics, so everything stays still. Even though we know that there is something called deflection, we're talking about moving around in space. Staying still means it's in equilibrium. We can use vectors to draw a force. We can use pretty pictures called free body diagrams to show all of those forces and reactions and prove that something's in equilibrium. And if we know the forces, we can use the free body diagrams to calculate the reactions. If an object is still or static, every part of it is static. And we have three equations that can do that, help us do that. The sum of the forces in the y, sum of the forces in the x, and the sum of the moments about the z axis. Okay, we're getting to the end of the hard stuff, so take a deep breath. I know this went a few minutes long, but I did. I wanted to go through those examples in great detail for you. Some of you are going to find that you didn't need to watch all of that video. So, uh, I'll see you next week when we jump into the next component.